All right, guys, welcome to what is probably the most asked for video that I have ever had. I'm finally doing it. I know it's taken me probably a lot longer than you guys have wanted, but this is the skiff walkthrough video. I'm gonna go into just about every single thing that I can think of with this gift, all the questions that I've seen. Hopefully, hopefully I answer your questions. If I don't, leave them down below in the comment section. Man, I, I honestly do not know how long you guys have been asking for this video. One of the reasons, a couple of the reasons it's taken me so long is one, uh, I wanted to spend a lot of time on the boat. I wanted to run the boat in a lot of different environments so I could really hone in um, a lot of experience with my skiff before I went into answering a lot of these questions. The other reason is, is I was trying to figure out how I wanted to film this. Um, I'll be honest, initially I really wanted to film a lot of this on the water. As you guys who have been following this channel for all, a long time know, I'm still working out my audio, especially outside and in the wind. Um, and then as I've started doing more tips and tricks in the house style videos, it kind of dawned on me like, you know what, I'm gonna go with this style of video. Today, right now, it's a windy day. It is cold as I'll get out. So I said, you know what, if I'm ever gonna have a day where I should be doing this video, it's gonna be today. All right, for those of you that don't know, I own a 2020 Sabine Skiff Versatile. And I will tell you right now, if you aren't sure what a Sabine Skiff is, I'm gonna leave the link to their website down below, so be sure to check them out. Um, if you wanna see them more in action, pretty much just go to the playlist called Rough Log, and I think it's probably in 80 to 90% of those videos, you can see that boat 100% in action on the water. Um, you can see it everywhere from Louisiana, Texas, Florida, you'll soon be able to see it in Florida. <laughs> it's been to Florida a couple of times, it's been to South Carolina. Um, I gotta get, that's on my, if you were to look at my editing list right now, I've got, uh, I think 14 videos that I need to get edited and another 10 that I wanna shoot for you guys before I leave in like three weeks. Um, so anyways, 100% check out the Sabine Skiff link as well, I recently sat down with Brian Little, who is the owner of Sabine Skiffs, and shot a podcast. That already is out. There's a link. Yeah, it's on that side. There's a link right there for you guys to listen into that podcast. Um, in addition, I talked a little in depth about Skiffs with the guys on the Ramblin' Fly podcast. I'm going to leave a link to that down below so you guys can check out what I had to say to them about that was more geared towards skiffs in general and a little bit of why I love the skiff that I own. This video is gonna go into way too much detail for you guys on why I love the skiff that I own. All right, like I already mentioned, I own a 2020 Sabine skiff. It is a tiller handle skiff. I've got a grab rail on the side. It's powered by a 50 horsepower Tahatsu. As for the hull of the boat, she is a tunnel hull and the hull is actually flat bottom. There is no dead rise to her. Um, a, co a couple of the other things, um, I got the motor mounted on a Bob's Machine jack plate, and as you can see the way it's mounted right here, it actually sits pretty high up out of the water. I'm also running a pair of Linko trim tabs, which after running on a few skiffs with and without trim tabs, I will 100% tell you that I'm a firm believer in putting trim tabs on skiffs. Uh, they help, they just, they're amazing. I think that you should have them. They help in rough weather, or they can, they help the boat out a ton in rough water, as well as they help keep that back end of the skiff up, up a little bit flatter if you have to run skinny. As for the size of the skiff, overall length 17 foot 6 inches, and she's got a 55 
inch beam at the water line and a 78 inch beam across the deck, which I'm gonna talk more about the deck and the way it's laid out a little bit later in the video. All right, one of the first things that you need to know about Sabines is they are 100% aluminum. Now, that being said, Brian does have a carbon skiff in the works and I'm really excited to see that boat when it comes out. And I will tell you when it comes to the aluminum hull, I absolutely love it. Uh, I get asked a lot, how do you feel about the aluminum versus fiberglass? Honestly, I do my best. I honestly do my best to avoid hitting oysters, going over oysters, try to leave them alone. But as you guys all know, there's always that one little oyster or clump of oysters that is just sticking up a little bit more than you think it is and they reach up and they grab the bottom of the boat and it's really nice knowing that I don't have to worry about gel coat repairs, I don't have to worry about pump, uh, and I don't have to worry about punching a hole in the bottom of the boat just from running over those things. I mean, I will tell you right now that um, when we were in Florida, we were dragging the skiff over limestone rocks and I was, okay, I was sweating it a little bit, but... <laughs> I knew that I knew the boat could handle it. It's just the you know, it just dragging your boat over rocks a little bit. Just one of those eh, not my favorite thing. Uh, it did lead to some awesome fishing, so it was 100% worth it. The next big thing I get asked about aluminum is, oh, how loud is it? I bet because it's aluminum, it's super loud. I can tell you that it is not loud. I mean, if your buddy jumps off the casting platform or someone slams a cooler. It's gonna be loud. But I think, I mean, from what I've seen, it's gonna be loud in a fiberglass boat. So I wouldn't recommend doing jumping jacks on the bow of the boat. Just don't do that. Especially if you're on a flat, and especially if you're seeing redfish on a flat. I don't care what boat you're on, fiberglass, aluminum. If you're jumping up and down on the skiff, it's gonna be loud. The next thing with aluminum that I get asked is about the whole slap. And I think that's more of where everybody, when they're asking about how loud the boat is, they're gearing, they're asking more towards the whole slap aspect of the boat. If you go on to the Sabine website, down at the bottom, it says no whole slap aluminum polling skiffs. And I will tell you that that statement is 100% without a doubt in my mind, accurate. I have tried to figure out how to make there be some whole slap. I can tell you like if you push the boat really hard into some really decent chop, yeah, there's gonna be a whole slap. Again, goes back to the jumping jack thing. I don't think there's a boat out there that's gonna be able to avoid any kind of noise in that situation. Probably not the best conditions for fishing right there anyways. Since I've gotten the skiff, I've started really paying attention to other skiffs I've been on, trying to listen for whole slap, just to try to compare them. And in my opinion, there isn't a quieter boat out there. All right, as I already mentioned, the hull is a flat bottom hull. There's no dead rise. Um, and this does have some pros and some cons. If you get into heavy chop, crossing a bay, going up a channel or something, it's gonna ride a little bit like a flat bottom boat. You're gonna bounce a little. In terms of how dry the ride is, I will tell you right now that it is a very dry riding boat. There are conditions in which you will get wet as you're riding. Normally it involves a 25 knot wind and one to two feet of chop, which <laughs> that goes back, I think, to a lot of what you're going to probably hear me say is any boat's going to be like that. Um, you know, I don't care if you get into those conditions, you're going to get wet. It's just that's the conditions of the day. That's what's going to happen. Now, the upside of having a flat bottom skiff is when you start pulling. Um, now I know what you're thinking immediately is, oh, well, flat bottom boat's not going to track at all. Actually, this boat tracks phenomenally. I'm going to get a little bit more into that a little bit later, but I'll tell you right now that this boat traps, tracks phenomenally. Um, some of the reasons I like the flat bottom is one, if you get into a high spot on the flat, generally you can just push the boat across it. You don't have to worry about a, a, a dead rise digging into the bottom. Um, if you start trying to push across something that's a little bit higher and you realize that it's not going to work, you can easily back yourself off and get turned around. And if it's one of those spots where you know you need to get across it to get into a lake or a pond or somewhere further in the back, you can get out and push it. You can get out, 
pull everybody out of the boat and I swear this boat will, this boat with nobody inside of it, it's gonna float in four inches, three, four inches of water. That might be a little bit of a gross <laughs> over overestimate overestimate oh, fucking hell. Overestimation. Over we're just gonna go with overestimate. That might be a little bit of an overestimate in a water depth, but you take everybody out of the boat, you can generally slide it just, to, I mean, you could probably slide it, no, that's too much. You can generally slide it across. As long as there's a little bit of water, you can get her across it. It might be a little bit of work. Um, I know Zach and I have had to push that boat way too far before. Check that out in that video. All right, guys, the next thing when it comes to flat bottom this boat is that I get asked a lot is what does she draft? Now, I got a little bit of a backstory. So for the longest time, I will be honest, I 100% got this number wrong. I was visiting with, with Brian. We actually shot a really cool uh, video at Sabine. Check that one out. Um, going through their entire shop. He showed me a bunch of behind the scenes of what's going on and allowed me to share it with you guys. So if you guys wanna see what's going on in the Sabine shop, you should check that video out. For the longest time, I told everybody, without a doubt in my mind, that boat with three people on it, full tank of gas, full ice chest, she's gonna float in three inches of water. And Brian, Brian pointed out to me, he goes, Pete, do you know, like, this is, he pulls out a tape measure, he goes, that's three inches, all right? That's three inches. If you guys want a quick reference, that's about the size of your index finger. If you ever get bored, your one of your knuckles is about an inch. Um, so, after, since then, I've I've you know altered my answer to this to a actual reasonable, realistic number. Uh, three people on the boat, full tank of gas, full cooler. You're looking at five inches, six inches drafting. If you look at a mid-slot redfish from its belly to the top of its dorsal fin it's probably gonna measure out at about four or five inches. So five to six inches is gonna put you exactly where the redfish are. Generally, we're not even fishing that shallow unless it's summer months and the fish are in those zones. Typically, we're fishing a foot, a foot and a half foot of water somewhere in there. I know that there is a joke in that whole entire segment. I know there's a joke in there. I don't wanna go into that. I kind of do, but I'll let you guys, you guys, you know what? You guys make the jokes. Uh, Cause I think there's too many and I just don't have time for that. <laughs> All right, the next big thing that I always get asked about is how well does, does she pull? How well does this skip pull? And I will tell you that she pulls like an absolute dream. Um, the biggest thing that I've learned the more and more I've used her is as the wind starts picking up where you get 15, 20, 25 knots of wind, the biggest, the best thing you can do is keep the boat, keep the skiff moving forward and keep some momentum, keep her underway, keep some momentum on her, and she's gonna continue to track, to track really well. If you get into those heavier wind conditions, the best thing you can do, push her downwind and then turn up into it. Um, There's just some tricks I've learned. I will tell you, on windier days, she will get set down by the stern if you're not keeping some momentum on her. Uh, given the fact that the motor's up in the air, followed by whoever's on the polling platform up in the air, it makes perfect sense. I think any skiff's gonna have this issue once you get into wind. It's just, you got a lot of sail area back there. Wind's gonna catch that sail area. It's gonna start pushing that, that downwind. Um, one of the reasons I think this boat tracks so well is that the way it's designed, there's only a few inches of freeboard above the water line on the gunnels. The gunnels are designed to be low. This boat was made in Texas. It was designed for Texas and it thrives in Texas, 100%. I know any day of the week we're going out, by the end of the day, we're gonna be seeing, dealing with 15 knots of wind. And I know that I don't have to worry about it when it comes to pulling the skiff. The guy on the bow being able to make a cast, that's a whole different topic. The other thing that I'll say to how she pulls is she is super maneuverable. Uh, tight creeks are not a problem. That really nice thin draft at the waterline uh, or beam at the waterline really helps you get into some of those tighter creeks, especially when you're trying to get into some back areas and you gotta go through a, a skinny creek, you can get her through there. It might take a little bit of time, but she can get through those areas without a problem. 
absolutely 100% pulls like a champ. Just honestly keeps surprising me how well she handles. All right, so you had an idea of how well she pulls and how well she drafts. And now, the, now comes up the question of, well, how skinny, how shallow can you get her up on a plane? How shallow can you run her? And I'm going to tell you guys, honestly, I don't know the answer to this. Um, I can tell you that it's a lot skinnier than you think. Uh, but the thing is, is a lot of these skiffs are designed and built so they can run skinny. And my personal thing, my personal viewpoint is that you shouldn't be running skinny. You sh should be running in deeper channels. You should be avoiding running flats. Uh, and that's why a lot of the time, and, and I'll tell you right now, that's why I don't have an answer for that. When I am polling, I pull to deeper water before I jump up. Uh, I do my best to avoid running across flats. I go, I'll go around them as much as, I, as, much as possible. Um, and the reason I say as much as possible is because there are times when I think that those actions are somewhat acceptable. And those, and those times that I'm talking about are emergency situations. Um, you get caught in a really bad lightning storm, somebody on your boat starts having a medical situation, whether it's an illness or personal injury. I think at those times when safety of life comes into fact, those are the times when you need to get back to the dock as quickly as possible. In my mind, that's the only time stuff like those kind of actions are acceptable. And I think the ability of the boat to handle that those situations is something that you should know, but not something you should use. It's something that if there's an emergency, you know the boat can handle the situation to get you home. And as someone that spends way too much time on the open ocean, that's something that always plays in my mind whenever I step on a craft. Isn't so much as can this boat get me to where I need to go, but is can this boat get me home? And can this boat get me home in conditions that are extreme. Um, and that's one of the things that I do love about this boat is I have 100% faith that she can get me out of trouble. She can get someone that's injured home no matter what what we're dealing with for weather conditions. Uh, so honestly, that's, that's where I'm at with that. Just because your boat can run skinny doesn't mean you should be running skinny. All right, the last thing on the exterior before we jump onto, into the cockpit, into the interior of the boat, is I want to talk to you guys a little about that Tatsu 50 that's sitting on the back. Because I've heard that there's mixed reviews on the market. This is my own personal experience, my own personal viewpoint on that Tatsu. Right now, I am just guessing that I've got roughly about 100 hours on that motor. I know what you're thinking, Pete, you've only had it for two years. How have you been? How have you put that much? I can tell you guys right now, uh, if you look at the number of rough logs, that is not how much I go fishing. That is a fraction of how much I get to spend on the water. When I'm not at sea on the open ocean, I try to go out almost as every day that I can. But I will tell you that that motor is bulletproof in my opinion. Um, it I've never had any issues with it. She'll go roughly eight to 10 miles per gallon. So with a 15 gallon fuel tank, I'm looking at a little over a hundred nautical miles that I can run the boat um, in terms of range. Uh, I have yet to push that all the way to the extreme, mostly because every single ounce of my merchant mariner training tells me don't push that to the extreme. If you think you're getting close to the extreme, bring a spare fuel tank. Uh, <laughs> uh, and if you are bringing a spare fuel tank, that's your fuel tank to get home. But anyways, as for the maintenance, I do all the maintenance myself, um, which actually need to do. Um, I try to run fresh water through her every time I pull her off the water. I can tell you right now that I don't, especially when I'm on trips um, and I don't have access to a way to, to flush that motor out. She might sit there for a few days before she gets flushed out. I've had zero issues with it. The maintenance to do it yourself is super easy. As I start running through some of the maintenance items that I've got to do this year on her, I'm actually going to put together some tutorials for you guys. Uh, if you want to do your own, I want to say that the 40, 50, 60, to, this is without looking up. Without having done research, I want to say that the maintenance that I'll do on mine will be pretty similar for the 40, 50, and the 60 horsepower Tatsus. So if you've got one of those, um, like I said, I don't have a timeline on when I'm going to have those videos out. 
but you guys can expect some tutorials at some point on taking care of those Tahatsu uh, outboards. All right, before we get into the interior, if you haven't already, please go ahead, hit like, hit subscribe. It's super easy. It's like two clicks. I mean, there's a button right over there that you click on and then it says, would you like to subscribe? And then you click subscribe. It's that easy. Uh, it really means a lot. It helps out the channel. It helps me keep making these videos for you guys. So I really appreciate it. Um, all right, interior. So as you guys have probably noticed by now, she's got two main hatches. Um, she's got one up forward and one in the stern. The one up forward holds the fuel tank, which like I already said, it's a 15 gallon fuel tank. And then in front of it, you see you've got a bunch of storage. Uh, these are dry compartments. And I can tell you, I have put water through the entire boat. I've opened them up afterwards to check them and they are completely dry. These things are watertight. Um, I leave, I will leave my camera gear up in the bow and I don't even sweat. I don't even worry about it. I'm actually really bad about leaving my drone in there for way too long. And I need to start using that thing more. Anyways, I'm getting out of control. The after hatch, the after hatch is where you're gonna find your battery, your battery switch, your fuse panel. And as you can see, I've got some switches in here and these control the under gunnel lights. Yeah, I've got under gunnel lights. I grew up watching the Fast and Furious, of course I've got under gunnel lights. And I'll be honest, when you start setting this boat up in the dark, those things are money. They just light up the whole interior of the boat, give you some extra light to see what you're doing uh, on those early, early mornings. The other thing I've got in here is a couple USB charging ports, which I had Brian put in. That's an option you can get, and I highly recommend it. It's pretty nice to, on those longer days on the water, to be able to throw your phone on there, get a little boost of a charge on there. Doesn't kill your battery at all. Um, so yeah, definitely worth putting that into the boat. I'm really glad that I did it. All right, as you can see, I had Brian leave the cockpit wide open. Now, if you want any kind of console or grab bar, or if you can dream it, Brian can make it happen for you. Um, again, I know I mentioned this earlier, you should definitely check out the walkthrough video I did with him at the Sabine shop because he had some really cool builds at the shop at the time, some really unique builds that I think really will highlight what he and his team are capable over there. So I had the cockpit left completely wide open and my, my long-term plan is to be able to use the, the skiff as a makeshift tent or as a duck blind. So I really wanted to leave the cockpit open so I'd have those options pretty easily. Um, I think with a side console, you could still get away with both of those options. Um, but I also, the other thing is I like standing up when I'm driving. Uh, unless I'm making an hour and a half run and then I don't like standing up for that long because it's a long time. Now what you will see down in the bottom is some Yeti tie down uh, locations. Basically these are set up for 65 quart Yeti. Um, one of the things that I wish I had done was at the time of the build had Brian go ahead and build a backrest for my Yeti cooler. Um, he makes them completely removable so if you don't want them you can take them off and then he'll powder coat them to match the rest the rest of your boat. And the stitching that they those guys do, that is upholstery guys do, is absolutely amazing. If you guys wanna see it firsthand, you should check out the skiff build he did for the guys over at Turtle Box. It looks amazing. Um, this this is something that's on my, like, things I wanna to do to the skiff short, short list. Uh, I just fish, I'm just fishing too much. And I don't have time to get rid of my cooler so he can use it. I actually probably could do it without one. Huh. I should probably talk to him about that. Rod storage. This skiff is going to hold six rods. Six fly rods. Ah! I throw, I'll throw. i throw conventional rods under there. No problem. Um, it's going to hold three on each side. And the way these are set up is so that the reels are facing forward. Which is one of those things that I absolutely love. I don't get... I kind of... Alright. I get why a lot of manufacturers will put the rods with the reels facing aft. Um, I think if I was guiding a lot more, it I would prefer them facing aft. Um, I know people that aren't as familiar with under gunnel uh, rod storage have a tendency to break the tips off rods. So I can see where if I was in a guiding situation, 
that would be something I would want. I'm not in a guiding situation, so I don't have to worry about that. And I really like that whoever's going up on the bow can reach down, grab the rod, pull it out, turn around, boom, there they are. Um, I think one of the other reasons probably that a lot of companies put the rods with the reels in the stern is they utilize the extra, extra space uh, in that forward hatch for uh, running tubes so they can protect the rod tips and the rod tips can sit up in that forward storage area. Regardless, I know personally, I absolutely love having the reels sitting at the front of the boat. Honestly, also like from a filming and photo standpoint, it makes a lot easier to take photos and, and uh, shoot film of that stuff. All right, so the rods are stored underneath the gunnels and the gunnels, I think, are worth taking time to talk about a little bit because I absolutely love these gunnels. Uh, they're designed to be full walk around gunnels. You know what? You know what? Here's a clip of my buddy Alex Blackwell fighting a fish and fully utilizing the walk around gunnels. Let's go! Alright, granted, he almost fell in that clip trying to get across the boat. Uh, that fish that he had on was, I think, at the time, it was his personal best. It might have just been his personal best redfish in Texas. So we were all really excited. We did not expect to find a fish that big in that zone, and we did, and we hooked it, and then the fish decided he was going to see how many times he could circle the boat, and Alex really didn't want to lose that fish. Um, but here's a link, here's a quick drop down link to that full video. That's a that's a really fun one, uh, and it, it can show you it, that one definitely shows you some of the the things that that boat can do. Really, this boat can do really well. Controls in the cockpit. Um, as you guys can see, a majority of the controls are tucked down in the starboard, back on the aft wall of the cockpit on the starboard side. And there's a grab bar over them that's gonna help you keep from accidentally hitting them as you step in and out of the boat or as you're moving around in the back of the boat, which I really like that this grab bar is here because I can tell you I bumped into the grab bar plenty of times. These controls control the trim tabs as well as the nav lights, bilge pump, and the under gunnel lights. I would tell you that on the new builds that Brian's come out with, he's updated the switch panel where it's completely labeled as well as has little Sabine badging. I think it looks amazing. Um, as for the controls for the trim and tilt as well as the jack plate, I've got those located on the grab bar. So when I'm sitting in the back, I got my hand up on the grab bar. I can easily access trim and tilt. If I need to get to the, uh, the trim tabs, they're basically right underneath where my left hand's gonna be. I also have a second set of trim and tilt jack plate and trim tab controls up on the polling platform. So if I am standing up while I'm driving, I still have easy access to all these. And I'll be honest, a lot of times I forget after running to pick the trim tabs up and it's really nice that I can easily throw my foot over there, push the trim tabs, bring them up without having to climb back down in the cockpit. Um, definitely 100% recommend controls, on, controls for this stuff up on your, uh, polling platform. All right, C deck. This stuff is amazing. Now, if you've ever gotten a quote to put C deck anywhere on your boat, you know this stuff is not cheap. And I think rightfully so, because it is phenomenal. Uh, one of the things that I wish I had done is I'd put more C deck, especially over the back hatch and around the back hatch. Uh, I've found that I spend a lot of time standing on that hatch when I'm running and it's not super comfortable because I don't have that sea deck there. And it probably when I'm sitting on that back hatch would, would make me a little more comfortable sitting there. Um, the other thing that I would do that I want to do one day, I think this is like in my two or three year plan for the skiff is, uh, put thicker padding on the casting platform and the polling platform. I was out with my buddy Wes and he's got a thicker pad on both of those platforms. And I, I really, really liked it. One of the things about the sea deck, though is I think even if, if 
if you're just looking at putting a little bit of C-Deck anywhere on your boat, I would 100% tell you to put it on your polling platform. Uh, the grip is amazing. I never feel like I'm going to slide off. It doesn't matter if I've got what I've, what I've got, you know, if I'm barefoot, if I've got shoes on, like the grip is just phenomenal. Um, so I would highly recommend no matter what you're running for a skiff, look at putting that stuff on your polling platform. Uh, I think it's definitely worth the money for it. The only thing that I will tell you and I will warn you and I'll caution you against, or well, a couple of things with Sea Deck is one, um, if you're fishing a lot of mud and you get mud in the boat or if you get blood blood in the boat, like try to get that stuff cleaned up before you go on to try to find another fish. Um, it can stain. I think some of the stains that you'll see in mine are from longer trips where the boat didn't get washed and I was like, ah, I'll get it out later. Um, you can work those stains out. It takes a lot of elbow grease. Uh, and I still haven't really mastered keeping that stuff clean. Um, I should probably talk to Kaler. I might try to talk to the Sea Deck guys for y'all and try to get a really good cleaning regimen for that stuff and put a video out talking about that stuff. I think that that would be really beneficial to you guys, especially if you're looking at Sea Deck. The other thing with Sea Deck is if you're using, uh, as my buddy Blackwell calls it, a Key West style boat wash, we're using a pressure washer. You have to be careful. Uh, I typically don't let other guys wash my boat because if you get that that pressure washer tip too close to that sea deck you can cut it um, i know i've cut mine at least once in one place from that um, so yeah it's just something you got to be aware of and you just got to be cautious with i try to give the boat a good deep cleaning at least once or twice a month depending on how busy i am uh, overall i love the stuff just some words of caution for it if you're going to look into it i think you should do it all right, the only other thing that is on my list, but it's like way down low on my list of things that I'd like to do to the skiff is add a trolling motor. 97% um, of what I do, I don't need a trolling motor. And that's why I didn't put one on in the first place, honestly, is because I knew I wasn't really gonna use it that much. and I didn't wanna spend the money on it at the time. However, I really do enjoy fishing dock lights at night. Um, I've been toying with the idea of trying to get out to the jetties a little bit. In those two instances, you definitely need a trolling motor. Again, I haven't really got to the point where it's like, that's what I wanna go do today. So I really haven't put a lot of thought into adding a trolling motor to mine. Um, <clears throat> I will tell you though, that the way Brian installs those, if you're not using it, all you're gonna have on your boat is the pot. You can easily pull the motor, or you can easily pull the trolling motor off, and you can easily pull the battery out, and you're just gonna have a puck, um, and I guess the wiring as well. So, if you're thinking about it, but you're worried about it taking up space or it adding a bunch of weight, like the way that he's got those things set up, you're if it's not there, you're not even know that it was supposed to be there. Well, you kind of know because of the puck, but if you want one, get one. There, that's what I'm gonna say. All in all, I don't think you guys are gonna ever see me not running a Sabine skiff. The boat is just too perfect for what I do, where I fish, and 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 the explorer, especially like when it comes into how much I like to explore new areas. I, I really like knowing that I've got a durable skiff that can handle just about anything and it can get me home. Um, if you guys aren't already, you should go over to Sabine Skiff, follow them on their Instagram account. And then that'll actually show you a lot of the behind the scenes of what they're doing. Brian loves to show off what he's got, what he's got going on in their fab shop um, and in their rigging shop. And he's got a lot of stuff going on right now. They've got their new carbon skiff coming out, which I am extremely excited to get a chance to check out. I know I'm forgetting something. I know that there is something that you guys probably want to know that I should have known and I didn't answer it. And if I didn't, Leave it down in the comment section below and I will answer it or I will get you the answer for it. As always, thank you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope that I answered as much as possible. If you haven't already, hit like, hit subscribe, check out some rough vlogs, see the boat in action, not just in my garage. I can't thank you guys enough for all the support that the channel's been getting lately. It's been growing. Um, I'm getting excited. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm looking at full time soon as in like the next year or two, but still, uh, really appreciate all the support. Thank you guys, see y'all next time.